Dr. Leachin. That was truly fascinating, a truly refreshing take on Gulf-Russia relations. You have sort of unfolded the comp underlying complexity. You have delineated facts from fiction and you have undoubtedly vetted our appetite to know more and which we will be doing in the Q&A. I can already see a lot of questions coming up and I'll be inviting uh, the, uh, the audience to ask the questions directly to you. Their questions are also typed here and I'll do them in the order they have come. So uh, may I invite Professor Kumaraswamy to put across his question? And this question is also in the chat box. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a delightful uh, lecture and I think uh, we all, uh, it's a very enriching experience. My only question is, given the tension in the Gulf between the Arab countries and Iran, how does Russia manage its relations on both sides of the Gulf? Thank you for your question, Prof. Uh, very good question, and a question that has um, bedeviled uh, certainly Russia-Gulf relations. Now, um, the Gulf states in the past um, have tried to uh, entice uh, Russia um, away from supporting Iran. So they have tried to dangle uh, some carrots, like for, for instance, you know, um, our biological weapon systems or, you know, our investment in the economy. They've tried that several times, particularly the Saudis, uh, but each time they have been rebuffed by Russia. And I think Russia has made it very clear by now, and I think the Gulf have also learned by now, that Russia is not going to be moved by that simply because Russia will not be bought off uh, when it comes to uh, certain key priorities, uh, priority areas. And I think for them, uh, Putin has always said about Iran, Iran is our neighbor, right? It is there, it is a geographical factor. We cannot just move away from Iran. Iran is a reality in our neighborhood and therefore we have to engage with them. Right? And so, you know, it is our interest to engage with Iran, uh, you know, uh, at, even before the sanctions that came on Iran, for example, Russia had a very good trade relations with Iran, one of the you know, larger trade partners. Um, and Russia has got a lot of uh, interest in Iran in terms of nuclear, in terms of the um, energy industry, um, in terms of, you know, helping, uh, you know, all the various investments that they've put in there before the sanctions took place. So I think Russia is very clear to the Gulf. Yes, um, we are going to try to walk a very narrow line. Uh, do, not, do not force us to choose because we are not going to do that. Um, as a great power, we are going to want to have our freedom of action. And so please do not force us to choose. And I think by now the Gulf states have kind of realized that they're just going to have to live um, with that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Leeson, for that answer. And if I can put up a related question now that you have touched upon Iran, is there some kind of a myth with in Russia-Iran relation as well? If you look at the GCPA in which Russia had a role in and supports Iran in many ways, but if you if you look at how it how the relationship has unfolded during the window period when the sanctions were not there, we could see that. Russia's share in Iran's um, arms import was barely 2.5%. Its first nuclear plant was commissioned with Russian help in 2011. And the second one could only come, it could only get started by November 2019. So there was not much of, you know, Russia did not step in a major way even during the window period of the GCPUA. So is there, so what's the fact and fiction in the Russia-Iran relations? Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the question. Um, I, I'm not the expert in Russian-Iran relations. Um, for that, there are quite a lot of other experts like um, Nikolai Kuzakov or Mikhail Gorshinsky. Um, they're, they're, they're the experts which I can refer you to. Uh, but from uh, my part, I would answer that Russia and Iran have not always had smooth relations. Um, they've had rocky relations, they've had difficulties, um, they've also had um, cooperation, and certainly uh, Russia-Iran uh, relations have taken advantage 
uh, of the JCQA. You know, as, as you said, the pre-JCQA period, it could have come in a bit more, you are right, yeah, um, to, help, uh, to, to help improve relations. But don't forget, Russia was also you know, under sanctions. Um, there are certain things that uh, Iran needs that Russia cannot provide. That, for example, they would need you know, parts uh, which say um, the West can provide for the, the oil industry, et cetera, which you know, French can provide, et cetera, um, and that Russia may not be able to provide and because of some sanctions. So um, yes, uh, their relations could have been better, but as well, there are certain uh, you know, roadblocks uh, with regards to um, Russia-Iran relations, um, re obviously rooted in, in history, um, et cetera. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your answer. Now, uh, um, may I invite uh, Mr. Samir Hafnaway, if I hope that's the right way we pronounce, the name is pronounced. Uh, can you put your question across to Dr. Lee Chin? I think you have two questions. You can combine them or ask them one by one. Mr. Samir Hafnaway. Can you hear me? Or I'll put your question across if it's an issue. I think I will do it. Uh, the question that uh, Mr. Samir uh, puts up is what about US Russia sensitive or delicate balancing of relations and its impact on the Gulf Russia relations? Uh, is, was there another question? You said there were two. The question is, what about U.S.-Russia balance, the relation, the balancing the relation between U.S. and Russia and its implication on Gulf-Russia relation? Maybe he wants to more, more detail about the, Rus uh, the U.S. factor in Russia-Gulf relations. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, for the uh, Russia, uh, the U.S. factor, um, look, uh, Russia's big um, interest is sanctions relief. and U.S. sanctions for, for a long time, and that's you know, crippling its economy. Yes, it has uh, managed uh, to overcome some of the difficulties through uh, local efforts, uh, but its big um, interest is still, it, it needs some kind of sanctions relief. So um, Russia has been trying to engage uh, the U.S. to try to relieve, uh, relieve uh, some of these sanctions. So that, that's one of its, its, its biggest um, I think it's one of its biggest uh, interests. So its impact on the Gulf, it's that you know, it, it wants to try to be seen as a good guy, right? It, that it has contributed to say stability in the Gulf. And hopefully that will put it in uh, the US's good books, um, particularly now uh, with, with the new um, Biden administration. Uh, so for example, it, it tries to mediate in, in conflicts uh, in and around the Middle East. Uh, prisoner exchanges, et cetera, basically to, to try to um, portray itself as contributing to, to Gulf stability rather than contributing to Gulf instability. Uh, for the Gulf states, um, they, they, also, they tend to use Russia as what you call, you know, the, the bogeyman, right? Um, so to the U.S., if you don't do A, then we have B, Russia, the bogeyman, uh, who are happy enough to supply us with, you know, arms, um, et cetera, um, so, uh, like, uh, you know, for kinds of defense systems, uh, so please, you know, tr uh, you know uh, remain in the Gulf, right? Uh, commit to us, uh, don't uh, withdraw too much from the Gulf. And a particular example I can give you of is of the Sukhois. So the UAE, I believe in 2017, expressed a lot of interest in a Russian, um, you know, a new generation um, fighter jets. And um, there was a lot of talk about them maybe even, you know, producing some parts of the Suhoi in the UAE. So there's been a lot of talk about that for many years now. But try as I might, I cannot find any, uh, you know, solid evidence that has been traction uh, on this uh, Suhoi fighter issue. And I suspect that maybe part of it is 
that the UAE was uh, dangling the Sukhoi fighters because they've been wanting the American F-35s for a very, very long time now, for many years. And so this was kind of like to push them and said, look, if you don't give me the F-35s, I'll go for the Russian Sukhoi systems, uh, fighter jets. So, so I think, you know, they, they used in the, uh, you know, the, the US, Russia and the Gulf states have a kind of a triangular relationship yeah, of, of a push and pull. And, and so we need to think about the US factor when we are looking at um, Russia Gulf relations. Uh, thank you, that, thank you, Dr. Ling. Uh, your mic is often unstable. Right now it's okay, but I think there is some, uh, it, sometimes it goes low. Uh, may I invite uh, Ambassador Sanjay Singh to put his question? He has few questions in the chat box. Ambassador Sanjay Singh? Uh, thank you, thank you, Samina. Uh, a very uh, comprehensive uh, presentation by Dr. Lee Chen. Uh, I had two questions. One is how did the Gulf, Gulf countries react to the Russian peace proposals of 2019? And second question is, uh, uh, does Russia still retain influence in Southern Yemen? Thank you very much uh, for your questions, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, is this better, Samina? Can you hear me a little bit more steadily now? It's still going up and down. Okay, I'll try and I'll try and speak a little bit louder and slower to account for the lapses. Um, okay. Um, so, uh, in response to your first question, um, Your Excellency. The answer is that the answer is that the Gulf states have reacted very politely. Okay, so um, they have been very polite about saying yes, thank you, very interesting, yes, thank you. Okay, so they've been very polite about that. There has not been a lot of um, uh, over enthusiastic responses, but I think the Gulf does appreciate that Russia is at least making an effort yeah, to try to present some kind of plan. And I think for Russia, it's been very important as well to show that they are actually, that they actually have some kind of plan. It's not just the Iranian sort of a plan or the um, American sort of a plan. The Russians have a plan, may not be very exciting, may not be very, uh, in fact, doable, uh, you know, for various reasons, but, you know, at least as a plan. So, yes, the Gulf have been very polite about it. Um, the only state that has been actually been quite um, forthcoming is China, uh, which actually uh, kind of endorsed the plan, right? So, um, could you remind me your second question again? I'm sorry. Uh, about Russian influence in southern Yemen. Very good, thank which you. they had considerable amount before unification. Thank you, Excellency. So, um, as you mentioned before, unification, um, Russia had a lot of influence in southern Yemen because of the, um, in the Marxist regime that was there in southern Yemen. Uh, obviously, the Soviets um, had a very big role in supporting them, um, not least uh, ideologically, but also materially. Um, these days, they do uh, retain, uh, uh, I, know, I won't say a lot, but suddenly there's influence there. Um, because the elites uh, in uh, southern Yemen, the, the, the communist elites, uh, are still very much um, around today, um, very much in uh, positions of relative influence. So yes, um, they do retain uh, some degree of influence. And that was actually what the UAE was counting on. Um, I think partly when it, uh, you know, engaged with Russia is to try and say, look, it's this third party thing, right, again. So uh, we'd like you to, you know, we'd like to use your leverage if you can to advance our interests in southern Yemen. So this is what I mean by the third party, again, being quite uh, significant in bilateral relations. Um, I, I, I don't have any evidence as to exactly, you know, what degree or what actually Russia has done with regards to the southern Yemen, but certainly uh, Russia has been talking to the southern Yemen, you know, to, to the ones in Sanaa itself, to the various parties involved in Yemen. Um, it is seen as uh, quite a uh, kind of like a, a neutral or respected kind of mediator. So I think that that really helps uh, its credibility and, and in turn that helps uh, the Gulf states who want to actually try to extract themselves uh, with as much uh, dignity as possible. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
Now, uh, may I invite Professor Kishi Xiang to put his question across? Uh, thank you very much, Samina, and thank you very much, Professor Sin, for this very uh, elaborate and detailed presentation. I learned quite a bit. I want to tie two points that you made and ask you a question. In your third mythology, you presented to us uh, President Putin as a pragmatic leader, uh, which of course he is. And then in the fifth myth, you spoke about the fact that uh, part of the uniform approaches, Russia has limited investments. As we all know by now, Russia's economy is smaller than that of Italy. So it doesn't have a lot of investments to throw away anywhere else around the world. My question is the following. At one point before the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, Russia had tremendous influence throughout the Arab world from Yemen, from Iran, from Iraq, from Syria, to Egypt, to Algeria, and you make a list. And of course, they've lost it all. In 2015, they came back to Syria to once again try to have a presence in the Arab world. So the question really is this, can President Putin remain a pragmatic leader while his hands are financially empty? Um, thank you very much, Jessa. That's a great question. And um, I would answer that by saying this. Um, the Middle East is not a key focus of Russia's foreign policy. Okay, um, So uh, I, I think that's quite important to, to understand. Um, you know, Russia is obviously, you know, very focused on, say, the U.S., right, uh, on, on its near abroad, the, the uh, post-Soviet states, uh, on Europe, right? Um, the Middle East, and I've talked to quite a lot of um, Russians about this, the, the Middle East comes in the outer concentric circle, if you like to think of that in foreign policy, right? It is not like near the, the core of Russian foreign policy interests. So in that sense, um, I think, um, uh, you know, uh, it, it doesn't have to put a lot of resources. Uh, it doesn't want to, it can't, as you mentioned. Um, and, and so it doesn't actually need to put a lot of resources uh, into um, the Middle East, right? It, it, it can leverage, as you mentioned, on its past glories. Um, but that isn't going to get them very far. They can't really leverage on their financial strength because you know they they, they don't really they can't really compete in that sense. Um, and Putin has said many times, you know, as being a pragmatic as he is, we're not going to give freebies anymore. If you want arms, you got to pay for it. Yeah. In, in the past, in the Soviet Union, yeah, we give you some arms, you know, because you know we, we're like you know, brothers in arms. But but not these days, right? So um, I think uh, because it is not that. Uh, core policy interest for Russia, what it will see is like uh, you will find it, it tries to get in on a cheap, if, if I can put it that way, right? So uh, it tries to do things like mediation. It doesn't really cost you a, a lot financially to mediate, right? Um, to, to talk to different parties. This is not very costly, but it's got quite a big bang in terms of your international profile, right? Um, Syria, by all accounts, its involvement was actually not that costly. And it, and it was a very big bang in terms of, you know, um, orders then for, for, for Russian arms from, from various um, uh, Middle East and North African states. So, so it tries to get in on the cheap. Um, so can it maintain its influence? Um, I think it can try, yes, but because it's not that key an area for, for, for Russia, it's not going to put in that much, you know, effort um, if it can get things on the cheap. May I, may I follow up? because you raised a very important point here. It is true that obviously the Middle East is not a priority uh, for Russia today. There are lots of other issues on President Putin's plate, but obviously they're trying desperately to have good relations with the Arab Gulf countries, including the UAE, including Saudi Arabia, coordinate oil policy as much as possible. In fact, within, even though Russia is not part of OPEC, there is a lot of coordination between Russia and the oil producing countries, especially Saudi Arabia. But at the end of the day, Russia is a global power. And even though it, its priorities are not in the Gulf, 
it cannot divorce itself from any part of the world. A global power has interests everywhere. And it cannot really say, well, this is not important. That's not important. I mean, obviously, that's, that's, that's the media stuff. The media tries to categorize these things. But great leaders don't think that way. For, for President Putin, the, the globe is his arena. He is interested in everything, everywhere. So therefore, you know, my, my dilemma in understanding Russia, and perhaps you can help me with this, is how this interest, in global interest, contradicts or, or contrasts with his pragmatic preferences. Or should we just say that the best thing that President Putin can do is to do mischief? That's all he can do. He cannot do anything good, so might as well do something bad. If, if that's, I mean, that's the alternative. I, I'm not being flipped. I'm not being facetious. I'm just trying to understand the level of his pragmatism and whether or not that pragmatism pays. Thank you. So yes, um, I think that's a very good point to to remember. Um, is Russia just a spoiler? Right? Um, is it there to just you know poke holes and things without actually trying to patch up the civil wars? Right? Um, there, there's a saying that you know um, you 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 cannot ignore uh, uh, Russia, right? But at the same time, Russia doesn't have the means or the energy or or the money to actually patch up the different states in a civil war. But it can sure um, make a nuisance of itself, right? Um, so absolutely right. Um, Russia is a global power, and, and I mentioned that it, it cannot, it, it, it has, its interest is to be seen as to be present in all parts of the world. So when I said that the Middle East was not uh, a priority, it doesn't mean it's not interested in it. It's got genuine, legitimate interests, um, but it, it just cannot, it just doesn't have the resources, and, and I'm talking not just about financial resources, but even um, in terms of military um, it's naval power, for example, um, uh, you know, uh, projecting it into Syria is one thing, but projecting it um, into the Gulf is a completely uh, different, uh, you know, kettle of fish altogether. So um, I think it is constrained, um, especially in the Gulf. But yes, it does have legitimate interest as a great power uh, all over the world. So um, I, I, I suppose my answer to you would be. Let's wait and see how he reconciles, you know, uh, that kind of, um, uh, you know, trade-off. But I, uh, my, my, my answer would be that he would try to do it on the cheap uh, in the Middle East, you know, but still be there, but, you know, on the cheap. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have Professor Gulshan Dietl here. Uh, may I invite Professor Dietl to, pu to put her question? Or comment? Samina, it was great listening to her, but I don't have a question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Um, we have a lot of more questions, and I think we may we extend the time by another 10 to 15 minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, Mudassar, may we benefit from your question? Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee Chen Sim, uh, for that very interesting and for very provocative uh, uh, you know, presentation. The way you put it, I think that made it much more kind of, uh, you know, uh, well-rounded in terms of how one looks at Russia-Gulf relations. Uh, I have a very similar kind of uh, a dilemma in trying to understand uh, how one looks at Russia in terms of if one looks at the security situation or the, one can say, insecurity situation in the Gulf. I mean, all the tensions between Gulf Arab countries and Iran, and then US and Iran, and there are so many other things going on. So is Russia a factor in the tensions, or it, it is just a minor factor, or whether Russia is a major factor? How would you look at it? Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I would say that Russia is, you know, it's not really the cause, you know, of, of these conflicts, right? So obviously these, these conflicts have their cause in, um, you know, domestic um, problems or in, in foreign relations between, you know, uh, within like say Yemen or you know, within Libya, there's more of a domestic problem. Uh, Russia doesn't 
uh, it's not a cause of these things, but you know, it, it certainly acts as you know, a pot stirrer, if you like, and in some sense, it, it stirs the pot, it, it makes it worse. But again, you know, um, does Russia itself stir the port or, you know, does it just, um, I would say that in some sense, the Gulf states have quite a muscular foreign policy of late and they have contributed to, you know, worsening some of these um, conflicts. Now, what Russia would actually like to try to do is to bring, um, funnily enough, some kind of stability um, to the Gulf region. It, it actually does not really benefit from instability. Um, instability is a problem um, to, in some senses from, for Russia because instability there means that you, know, you, you, have, you may have a lot of these um, terrorist fighters, extremist fighters you know, who, who then uh, sign up, they go to, to, to fight in these wars and some of them may come back to Russia. As you know, Russia has got quite a large um, uh, uh, Muslim population, around 10% of the population, and it could destabilize these areas or even destabilize Central Asian countries. And there are a lot of Central Asian workers in Russia itself. So, you know, th there's quite a lot of um, uh, uh, discomfort for Russia when, when there's instability in, in, in the Middle East. So I, I really, I don't think it, it really wants the instability. Um, it cannot do much to solve it on its own, yeah, but I, I don't think it's actually, you know, responsible for, for the uh, instability in that sense. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vick. Uh, may I invite Feza, a research scholar, to put up a question? Ms. Feza, can you put up your question? You... Hi, can you hear me? Um... Hi, uh, thank you, Dr. Leechin. It was a really interesting um, uh, seminar. My question for you is that um, where do Russian and Gulf relations diverge and converge when it comes to issues on minorities in uh, Russia? Because we've seen like um, a resurgence of the Russian Orthodox Church and there is a sort of symbiotic relationship that exists between the Kremlin and the church. And we've seen that in recent times, there is a you know, rise in the rhetoric of Islamic extremism in Russia, where the church is concerned that, you know, um, concerned about uh, a rise in Islamic extremism. And we can see sort of, you know, a situation where they're going back to the Islamic Christian struggle. So my, uh, this is why I wanted to ask you um, this question. Thank you very much for the question, Faiza. Um, I would answer it this way, um, uh, under Putin, right? Um, Putin has been very careful about um, extremism, right? Especially um, uh, uh, Islamic or Muslim extremism. He doesn't even use the word Islam and, and terrorism in, in, in the same way. Uh, in, in, in the same in the same phrase, right? Um, he's actually, I think, quite um, pragmatic in the sense that he sees, uh, I think, all kinds. I think, especially Islamic extremism is, is something that he doesn't want to see, right? Um, and uh, with regards to the uh, religious aspect, the, the Orthodox Church, I would say that there really isn't. I don't see a huge conflict between the two. Um, the, some of the Gulf states, uh, especially the UAE, are quite tolerant um, about the you know, live and let live attitude with regards to um, different religions. Um, I don't see a clash between the two. Uh, even in Russia, yes, of course, there's right-wingers on, on both sides in, 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 in Islam and, and in Orthodox Church. But again, um, it hasn't really been encouraged by, by Putin. So uh, I think that, you know, he is quite aware to put uh, that, you know, he puts a lid on that. Yes, of course, there are outbreaks. Yeah, but I don't think it's uh, the, the religious conflict, uh, whether in Russia or in um, the UAE it is or in the Gulf is a big thing at the moment. In fact, I think the Gulf states can contribute uh, to actually uh, reducing some of the extremisms of, say, um, the Muslim population, uh, Gulf states are seen as a model of a moderate Islam. So um, uh, previously it was just, a, well, it was mainly the UAE that was seen as a model of moderate Islam. So the UAE had very close links or had a decent links with Chechnya. Um, the leader of Chechnya, Kadyrov, was, you know, is always in uh, UAE um, and, uh, you know, various uh, 
if you look at fighting, you know, the, the United Fight Clubs and stuff like that, they're very popular. The Chechen fighters are very popular in Abu Dhabi when it comes to the fight clubs. Um, and recently, of course, Saudi Arabia seems to be actually a model of, you know, development in a Muslim state. So I think the Gulf states, in that sense, uh, for Russia, project quite a good model of how um, these, uh, you know, at these districts, uh, these um, areas like Chechnya, Dagestan, and Shetia can develop um, in Russia. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee. That was quite illustrative. Uh, we have a question by Mr. Durkan, who is a doctoral candidate in St. Andrews University. I'll put his question. He has some audio issues. He, he asks, how has Russia responded to the GCC crisis? Okay, thank you very much. Um, again, it will be a similar answer to the, what I gave you, Ambassador, very quietly, okay? um, very diplomatically because um, Russia doesn't want to be, well, doesn't want to choose, right? It's, it's you know, stuck in, between a rock and a hard place. It doesn't want to choose because, um, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's kind of rehabilitated its relations with Qatar. And so it doesn't want to then you know, dent that by supporting Qatar, right? Uh, on the other hand, and, you know, it's got very good relations with the, you know, with UAE and with uh, Saudis. And again, it doesn't want to dent those relations. You know, those relations relate to, say, possible nuclear deals. Um, you know, we've related to, you know, UAE has invested in the oil sector in Russia, which Russia is very grateful for, um, especially given sanctions. Um, uh, UAE has invested in, for example, um, um, uh, technologies like helicopter uh, groups and stuff like that. So it's very grateful for that and doesn't want to dent that. And in fact, I think oh, the Gulf is pretty astute because they have not asked Russia to choose. You know, it hasn't said choose us or them, right? Neither side is doing that. And uh, Russia will not, choose. as a great power, as um, you mentioned, Joseph, right? Um, Russia is not going to be boxed in either by its relationship with Iran um, or with um, Yemen or indeed in the Gulf. It wants absolute freedom of maneuver. Thank you. Uh, talking to everyone can be possibly Russia's one of its diplomatic achievements or accomplishments. Do you think it is also setting the limits to its aspiration in the region? Thank you. Um, absolutely. Um, I think, uh, I don't know whether you've heard this phrase that Russia is friends of everybody. Right. So Russia has got a friends of everybody approach. You know, it's friends of all parties in Yemen, friends of all parties in Syria or Libya or, you know, um, uh, in, in the Gulf. It's friends of everybody, Iran, the, the Gulf states, everything. Um, this is great in the sense that it's, it doesn't actually have an enemy. And not having an enemy, I think, is quite useful, even though none of them may actually be your true friends. Right? So none of them will actually gang up against you. So in, in that sense, friends of everybody approach is quite good. But on the other hand, it also means that you are very limited because you, you don't actually, you're not actually the proactive one. Right? You are kind of the passive actor that sees you know, what other people do, what are the circumstances surrounding them that makes you able to be friends with everybody. Because then, you know, you, you don't want to annoy this person, you don't want to annoy that person. So, you know, it, it does serve a purpose, I think, a very good purpose, compared to, say, under the Soviet times, right, when there were clear enemies, um, you know, clear allies. I think it does serve Russia's purpose now that there are actually no enemies, um, albeit they don't have really solid friends. But I think um, Joseph would agree that as a great power, you don't your aim is not really to have a bestie or, a, you know, lots of BFFs. Thank you. <laughs> that is very satisfactory. We have a question by uh, Dr. Jatin. Uh, Dr. Jatin, would you like to pose your question yourself? Thank you, Chair, uh, for giving me opportunity to ask a question. Uh, Dr. Lishin, my question is to you that uh, what kind of opportunities or uh, challenges Abraham Accords have created for Russia to engage with the Gulf region. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I think the accords themselves don't present an opportunity because you know Russia already pre-accords 
they already uh, engage uh, quite a bit or they already compete quite a bit with some of the Gulf states. What the uh, Abraham Accords does though, I think, is to actually reduce a little bit um, Russia's role as kind of like the mediator, right? Um, uh, yes, it's true that even before the accords, um, the UAE, for example, and um, Israel were, were you know, in, in discussions, albeit backdoor channels or very low key and low profile, but Russia was also seen to be helping as in having a mediating role uh, to, you know, to speak to uh, Israel about the UAE, for example. So what the accords now does is to actually reduce some of that role. Um, and I think that Russia's, yeah, I mean, if you've noticed, Russia has been quite muted about its reaction to the Abraham Accords. It hasn't actually come out and say, good thing, fantastic. You know, it hasn't actually said that. And I think that part of the reason for that is because it's, it's a bit wary about what the Accords will mean. Um, just to give you one example. So um, the Accords, uh, one of the outcome of that is that um, the UAE and Israel could actually be uh, exporting oil from the UAE to Israel, um, uh, to Europe, right? And I am not sure that Russia is very happy about that because um, Europe is its key market when it comes to oil. And having a com another competitor there, it may not make it the most comfortable. So, you know, in that sense, I, I think that's one reason why it's a little bit more muted uh, in, in, in that sense. And another reason could be also that um, with the Abraham Accords um, sitting in the UAE itself, um, there's a lot of enthusiasm about that in, in the UAE and in Israel. You know, you read daily news of you know, this deal being signed, that deal being signed between UAE and Israel, you know, lots and lots of deals being made. And I think if I were Russia, I'd, I'd be saying, oh gosh, then that kind of, you know, dents the momentum of, you know, Russia and the Gulf being, you know, um, going for more investment use and things like that, because then the, uh, the, the focus now is on Israel. So um, I think it's, it's a little bit of a muted response from there. But again, as I said, for Russia, probably stability, you know, it, it's a good thing. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee. If I can probe you a bit more on the energy front, you talked about OPEC plus grouping. Is it, I mean, how tenacious are the ties, especially between Russia and Saudi Arabia? Because you see there's a diversion of interest as to what is the uh, fair price that they would like to achieve. Their break-even prices are way different. And the political implications of bringing the shale industry back is much severe for Russia given its sanctions. So can you just throw some light on the tenacity of the OPEC plus grouping? Thank you. From the Russian point of view. Okay. Well, I think from the Russian point of view, what's interesting to note is that this is the first time Russia has actually coordinated its um, oil output policy with OPEC, right? Um, previously, uh, it, Russia was invited to coordinate with OPEC on about, I think, two or three other occasions in the past, in the 90s, in the early 2000s, they were invited to come on board um, to you know, raise the lower prices of oil uh, at, at those points. And Russia had always said no, or actually it said yes, but it didn't do anything about that, right? Um, but this, so this is the first time that it's actually agreed to, and I think that speaks to the degree of the challenge that these oil exporters face with regard to shale oil, and of course now with regard to the coronavirus and, and oil demand. Um, so um, you're completely right that they come from two divergent perspectives, um, uh, the uh, UAE, uh, sorry, um, Saudi Arabia and Russia. Uh, they, they diverge on price because one can, can survive, one works for a lower price, Russia, Whereas Saudis, as I mentioned, given their economic plans, et cetera, um, they need a lot, a lot of money. And so they need a much higher oil price. Um, I think also that the, um, the Russians uh, would like more production, um, whereas the Saudis are a little bit uh, less keen about uh, turning on the taps. And part of the reason has to do with the uh, reserve to production um, ratio, right? The, the how much oil is left in these countries um, at the current rate of production. 
in uh, in Russia, that rate is that is about 25 years. So at a current rate of oil production, uh, Russia's oil industry will last for another 25 years. Whereas um, using that same figure, if you look at Saudi Arabia or UAE or Kuwait, that ranges from about 70 years to 100 years. Right. So um, the Gulf states are in there for the long haul, right? Mm. And that's why they are quite happy with taking a more measured approach. Whereas for Russia, it's uh, it's here and now we're going to last for another 25 years, you know, given that you've got all these carbon tax regimes or whatever thing coming up and you know, we need to get the oil out now. We cannot wait uh, for the American oil industry to be, you know, damaged or whatever. We need to get the oil out now quickly out of the ground, you know, before, um, you know, things, you know, go bottom up. So I think the Gulf states have a much longer perspective in that. And that's why they are more, you know, uh, uh, you know with regards to turning on the taps, they, they just a little bit more measured about that. And I think they have also come to grips with shale oil. Yeah, since they take a longer perspective, they can kind of live with shale oil. Whereas the Russians are like, no, I want the market share. I need it now. I need to kick them out of the, the markets and, and, and things like that. So yes, very different perspectives. But nevertheless, they have come to an agreement, right? Yes, there are always frictions. that They, they negotiate. A lot of horse trading is going on but they do come to some sort of agreement and the agreement has lasted longer than any analyst has ever predicted, right? It started in 2017, it's now 2021 and it still holds. And I think this is something that's really unexpected. Many people thought that it would, you know, expire much earlier. Uh, thank you. There's one more question that has cropped up which you can answer briefly, possibly. Uh, what about the enthusiasm for Chinese vaccine more than the Russian one? Is it for medical reasons or for diplomatic reasons? Um, you mean in the Gulf? Um, that, that's quite interesting. Um, I think part of the reason is because um, for the Chinese vaccine, you have um, a UAE company, right, um, G42, that's involved in clinical trials. So, so that's the local perspective, right? There's really a local company that's involved in uh, Sinopharm um, trials uh, in the beginning, right? right? Right from the beginning. Whereas, uh, yes, they are doing trials uh, of uh, the Sputnik vaccine, but that has only come in uh, much later. So I, I don't think it's a question of like, oh, you know, um, it, it's kind of a political question. Uh, I think it's just, you know, that G42 came in much earlier with a uh, Sinopharm uh, because um, there are attempts to, there are moves to produce both the Sinopharm and possibly the Sputnik vaccine in the UAE. So, you know, both of these offer um, uh, the UAE a chance to diversify its economy through um, health pharmaceuticals. And also, I think what's really interesting if you're talking about vaccines is that um, the UAE has actually bought the Russian Sputnik vaccine um, and to send it to Palestine, right? To send it to Gaza. And that's really interesting from, from my perspective because, okay, one of the reasons is that Sputnik vaccines are apparently much cheaper than the Sinopharm vaccines, right? Um, but you know, UAE nevertheless chose to, to buy the Sputnik vaccines and send them to Gaza with a representative who does not get along with the current, um, you know, K president. So um, is that using politics, uh, vaccine politics? Um, you know, it's, 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 it's an interesting issue. Um, they could have used Sinopharm vaccine, yeah, um, but they used the um, Russian vaccine. So again, that, that's the question of, you know, that, that third party thing, it's quite interesting. What is UAE trying to show, you know, to, to, um, to the PA? Thank you, Dr. Lee. Truly fascinating conversation. We all have benefited immensely how you laid the relation threadbare. Really taking your time and effort, taking questions one by one, and we are able to see everything inside out. I thank all the participants for their questions, for their time, for their engagement. And now may I turn over to Professor Kumaraswamy to end the session. Thank you.